my privilege to present uh, this sitting presentation uh, and also um, a digital connect and uh, with a Bano member that is uh, going to be skyping in as well. So Napu speaks and informing us on key sovereignty issues will be presented by Susan Healy, uh, Ingrid Hugens and JJ Carberry will be um, uh, zooming in from his co-cal. Um, for many uh, Napui Fano, uh, I guess is a is a is a uri no, no, no Napui, um, and particularly from Hokianga, uh, this resource that they're going to be talking about this was an independent report that was commissioned by the Napui Pui and Komatoa a few years ago, and it's a beautiful compilation of uh, Napui Porero and Napui style. Uh, definitely by our very strong leaders in uh, back up home and who have connections back to the Napui. And, and probably one of my very favourite statements in there from um, co one of our co-mata, Nuki Aldridge, uh, is a quarter law about when the treasure dies, the spirit dies, and when the spirit dies, the body dies. And if we think about the context of this uh, Napui uh, report or Napui speaks, it is definitely about here Whakaputanga uh, and Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And so it's definitely my privilege um, to present uh, this next session with the two co-authors here sitting at Te Mahuri Huri Marae and Point Shev, as you're aware, and JJ Carberry, who is um, zooming in. So I'll leave it over to, to the whānau. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora koutou. We want to introduce ourselves to begin, um, and then we'll describe the whole process and the report, its findings and its implications. Kia ora tato. Uh, Kia ora JJ. Kia ora. Hai ko rangi nui ki runga ko papatua nuku ki raro. Ai te nga kōrua. Uh, ki ngā tini mate ko a whetūrangi tia. Haere, haere, haere atu rā. Ai te kōka o toku hoa. Uh, ko nene naula. Uh, te kōka o vrona katāwhai e te whaia e moi, e moi, e moi. Ahuri no ke a tātou katoa e te hunga ora te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā tātou katoa. Kia ora, JJ. He uri a hau o Ngāti Kahungunu ki Waira Rapa, o Ngāti Porau, o Ngāti Airani. Nō reira ko John James Mackenzie Carberry tōku ingoa. Nō reira, te nā koutou katoa. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou. Ko Susan Healy Taku Ingoa. I am a Pākehā of Irish, English and Cornish descent and a former student of Auckland University's Māori Studies Department. The insight and analysis I received through that education in Māori Studies was a tremendous help when it came to being part of the Ngāpui Speaks project. For me, it was the privilege of a lifetime to hear those who spoke at the hearing of the Ngāpui Nui Tonu claim regarding He Whakaputanga and Te Turiti o Waitangi. We encountered firsthand the mana, vision and determination of Ngāpui and its many hapu. I hope our report give some reflection of what we heard. Ngā mihi ki a koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Ingrid Hugens tōku ingoa. Ko Ingrid Hogens aho i te reo o tōku iwi. My people are from the Netherlands, immigrating here in 1952. My sisters and I were born here, speaking our Dutch language at home and learning English when we went to school. Our parents were confident in their culture, and particularly my father, enthusiastic about New Zealand's Māori heritage and language, something from my childhood that I've been very grateful for. I too studied at Auckland University in linguistics and social psychology, and I went on to Waikato University to train as a community psychologist. It was a labour of love and a life-changing learning experience to listen to all who spoke at the Ngāpuhi Nui Tonu hearings and to draw out the themes in their evidence. 
together with Susan Hilly and the other members of the panel, Takawai Murphy and Hori Parata, we attended the hearings over two years and wrote the report with the oversight of Titi Fly Harawera, Nuki Aldridge, Mary Mangu, and Hilda Halkir Harawera. And we also received much help from the team supporting them, and also from treaty and peace workers around the country. So to all who made this report possible, tēnā koutou. Susan and JJ will present first in part one, giving key insights and educational messages from the report. And then in part two, I'll share a key learning activity that brings these themes to life. Nō reira, nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Oh, well, our session is looking at Ngāpuhi Speaks, uh, particularly informing us on key sovereignty issues. So this is the cover of our report, um, commissioned by the Kuya and Kaumata of Ngāpuhi, Te Whakaputanga e Te Treaty o Waitangi, independent report on the Ngāpuhi Ngui Tonu Kei. So this session, um, the outline is given there, the main point of the whole session is to talk about how Napui speaks can be used as an educational resource. But in this first part, I'm actually going to just give some brief background on the actual report itself, particularly the points it brings out about key sovereignty issues. So uh, the main point here is that it is an independent report, and I'll continue. Uh, the claim itself, the Ngāpui Nui Tono initial claim, was a radical advance in considering sovereignty issues. The Waitangi Tribunal, since its inception in 1975, had been asked to work from the Māori and the English text of the treaty. Now, the English text is very clear that Māori ceded their sovereignty, and unfortunately, the English translation of the Māori text didn't take away from that meaning greatly. And so the tribunal tended to find itself caught between these two conflicting texts, the Māori one certainly not saying that ceded, uh, sovereignty had been ceded. What Ngāpui Nui Tonu said in coming towards the hearing is that before we present to you our issues um, concerning resources, we want to actually go to the heart of He Whakaputanga and Te Tiriti or Waitangi. And I'll be coming back to both those documents. Uh, so they were very clear that unless those documents and what they intended in going into them were understood, there was, that was vital to going ahead with understanding the issues that were to be looked at later on. So in March of 2007, the Taumata, Taumata Kaumata of Ngāpui Nui Tonu made a submission to the Waitangi Tribunal. In this submission, they said very clearly that it's vital that you listen to Te Tino Rangatiratanga of Ngāpui, that is, listen to the Ngāpui view of Te Tino Rangatiratanga and the Treaty of Waitangi. The other thing is that they felt that the claimant should have input on the actual tribunal hearing itself and that there should be international uh, members included. The tribunal took note of that first request but not of the second. So uh, Komata and Kuya of Napui decided that it would still be a value to have an independent panel and uh, key members who were behind this initiative were the Kuya, Titipai Harawira, Mary Mangu, Hilda Hawkyard Harawira, and the co martyr Nuki Aldridge, who wonderfully advised our panel. The members of the panel were Hori Parata, Takawai Murphy, Ingrid Hugens, and Susan Healy. These are some shots. Uh, 
it was just to give us a, 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 an impression of the vitality of the situation that we're in. Uh, the Waitangi Tribunal, Titi delivering the opening address on behalf of herself and Sir Graham Latimer. We have here Patul Kohepa speaking, who is very closely written to the marae here, and um, Eri Mahenare, whose son Kene was here earlier with us. One of the presenters was Moana Jackson, who spoke, uh, been asked as a key person, as you probably know from Ngāti Kahunu, but also as an international expert on Indigenous issues and on treaty issues in this country. And uh, he was supported um, in his presentation. And then that's a picture of those of us who are on the panel itself. So in the mandate that we were given for this report was ensure that your report truly reflects the evidence given by the Ngāpuri speakers. We want a report from the people's perspective. Lawyers for Waitangi Tribunal hearing sometimes recast what is said by Kuya and Komata, Komatua so that they do not recognise the information they have provided. We do not want this to happen. One of the things that I really believe is what you choose as a starting point in coming to any sort of uh, compilation of history of reports makes a huge difference. And I think it's good to point out the particular value of this report. There is huge value in the Waitangi Tribunal's own report. But I found in looking at the Waitangi Tribunal report that there is a weight towards the historical evidence, which inevitably is a colonizer's view of history. So we see uh, James Busby and his actions being given a preeminence as against the Ngāpui evidence. Um, so that as an example, uh, when you read about the flag, uh, the flag that was chosen because ships were seized in 1831 and this flag was chosen in 1834, if you read the conventional histories, and unfortunately that isn't hugely changed in the Waitangi Tribunal report, you get the impression that James Bubbsby swept in and that he was largely the initiator of the choosing of the flag. Whereas from 1831, when ships have been seized in the Sydney Harbour for not carrying an internationally recognised flag, Rangatira from the north started talking with people like Henry Williams, he was a missionary but he had a strong naval background, about possibilities of working towards um, a flag. And they actually, even when uh, Henry Williams had put some work into it, they insisted on having a much wider red cross there because red is so important in terms of symbolising mana. And the, so much of what we heard was about the mana that had been in Ngāpui and that continued through all these different events. And I've just written there, Ngāpui Speaks approach brings out what was demonstrated at the hearings, the integrity, the agency, the self-determination, the mana of the Ngāpui hapu and their rangatira. So there were significant new insights that certainly for people like ourselves that we gained from being at this hearing. Uh, one of these was about te whakamininga o ngā hapu o nūtirini. And Ingrid's going to say more about that. But hapu had gathered in the north at um, harvest time and discussed issues over centuries. But there was a particular, um, I suppose, impetus to that gathering of the rangatira at that time with the coming of uh, Europeans and the different issues that had to be faced together in their arrival. Um, we found out at the hearing that Te Whakamininga, in that uh, new impetus, started in a particular way, probably from about 1808. And that again is very different from the conventional histories that talk about um, this 
confederation of chiefs that more or less were brought into force very close to 1835. But there was a far longer history behind all of that. Uh, I'm going to take a minute before just to explain for anybody who isn't aware that this Whakamina uh, in 1835 and then there were other uh, major rangatira who following that time signed had Whakaputanga or Te Rangatira Tanga or Nuterini and this was a declaration to the world of their mana. Through their travels, they had seen how indigenous people were being treated in some other parts of the world. And both in terms of their identity, their trade, their links, they wanted that mana recognized internationally. And again, we uh, saw very clearly how so many events right back from 1808, 1820, continuously were about dealing with the issues of this, these links with the international world, but also ensuring that what was best for Ngāpui, that um, maintain the manner of, uh, of Ngāpui internationally was carried forward. So uh, people in a general history have often learned about what's called the Declaration of Independence of 1835, Many others of us hadn't even known that that existed, but it wasn't so much a declaration of independence because they weren't declaring themselves independent from anybody. It was a declaration of mana and of presence in an international forum. What was very, very important about this, and this was this new learning, the absolute critical importance of Heitakaka Putanga that it proceeded to Treaty of Waitangi. And I'm going to ask Ingrid, I'll just give the headings and make any points, to read out some of these key statements that were made by Rangatira who presented to us when we were up here for the hearing. So a quote from Bak Korefa of Ngāti Kaharo and Ngāti Hauki Omanaya. He Whakaputanga was a declaration to the world of Māori mana and sovereignty. Titiriti did not change this, but reaffirmed it as the coming together of sovereign nations to create an enduring relationship for the prosperity of all. So, he whakapuna tanga, we're told this again and again, is the base for understanding the Treaty of Waitangi. So, I quote from Rima Edwards, um, speaking on behalf of Ngāpui Nui Tonu, he whakaputanga Te matua, te tiriti, te tamaiti. So, te whakaputanga is the parent, te tiriti is the child. Ko te piringa o te matua kāwana i runga i te aroha i roto i te tiriti, hei noho tahi ki ngā rangatira. Ko te piringa o tērā noho tanga i wainga nui i ngā mana e rua nei, te mana o ingarangi me te mana or Aotearoa. The governor in the treaty would sit as one with the chiefs. So these two mana came together, the mana of England and the mana of the chiefs of New Zealand. He whakaputanga endures. So it's actually really interesting that um, right through to 1839, additional signatories that included um, Ngāti Kahununu, um, Waikato Tainui, and then even right through to 1890, there were rangatira from Hauraki that were signing. So it's not, it's a, it is an ongoing importance and significance. So from Hone Sadler, again speaking on behalf of Ngāpui Nui Tonu, according to the Houses of Learning, all agreed in Ngāpuhi that the treaty did not override the declaration, never. The treaty, its purpose was to allow foreigners to reside here because of our concern about the things they were doing at that time. So they agreed to this covenant. And these are some of the key findings that we came through in our report. 
very much in summary, that Ngāpui did not cede sovereignty. The Crown's claim that through the treaty, the Ngāpui Rangatira ceded sovereignty to the British Crown was false. The claimed session is a fiction promulgated by the Crown in the interests of imperial rule and benefit. The Crown's claim to sovereignty is not legitimately based. Even the British officials at 1840 recognised that the legitimacy of Crown authority in New Zealand would be dependent on Māori consent. What the Rangatira agreed was that the Queen's Governor would have authority to exercise control over British people in the areas of land they granted be the use of the Queen and her people. They did not agree to the Governor having authority over them, their hapu or their lands. The Crown's claim to absolute sovereignty overrides the will and intentions of the rangatira and hapu who assented to the Tūtiti or Waitangi. And even though our two reports differed in some respects, it was very, it's very significant to go to the conclusions of the Waitangi Tribunal. Mm. And these are two of them. The rangatira who signed the treaty in February 1840 did not cede their sovereignty to Britain. That is, they did not cede authority to make and enforce law over their people or their territories. That's a huge step forward in terms of a Crown appointed body making that sort of statement. The Rangatira agreed to share power and authority with Britain. They agreed to the Governor having authority to control British subjects in New Zealand and thereby keeping the peace and to protect Maori interests. And I think that the thing that struck me very, very forcibly and struck us very forcibly was that Napui had a very clear vision going into He Whakakutanga and Te Tiriti o Waitangi, and that, that vision, which is very positive for all of us, as Ming Boon was pointing out, continues. In going into Te Tiriti, Napui had an inclusive vision, the different peoples of this country working a lot alongside one another to the benefit of all. The intention was peace, based on respect for the law of the land, tikanga, and the rightness of relationship between tangata whenua and new settlers. This meant that hapu would retain their full authority and rights, but were willing to incorporate the new settlers on the basis of the reciprocity and respect that tikanga required. The Queen's Governor was given authority to bring order amongst British subjects and act as their leader and mediator and their relationships with the hapu. I'll finish the context here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I just firstly want to acknowledge um, those on the independent panel who um, were involved in this entire process, um, especially the uh, Kaumatu of, of Ngāpuhi Nui Tonu and their, uh, their initiative in making sure that this text has come to light. Um, as an outside uh, sort of observer, outside of Ngāpuhi, um, Ngāpū, he speaks, has become a, it is the core text in, um, in the treaty paper that I lecture here at Massey University, um, but I'm also a part of uh, Te Atakura Educators, so we're a community uh, treaty education uh, group, and Ngāpū, he speaks, is, uh, provides you know, a lot of the information um, and contextual helps us to contextualise for those learners um, that period of time leading up to the treaty. Why is that? Um, just because there is uh, so many entrenched myths with regards to the treaty, and 
as a consequence, um, as a consequence of the suppression of a lot of this history that comes through in Ngāpuhi Speaks, um, these myths have been able to sort of survive and they, they come through consistently in either workshops or in lecture theatres. And so Ngāpuhi Speaks plays a pivotal role in terms of our conscientization of participants and students. Um, <clears throat> I couldn't help but um, our week has changed somewhat, our organisation for today's event um, as a result of, you know, the pandemic that has, has struck the world. And I, you know, last night I really couldn't help but think of our tūpuna um, when first introduced to Europeans and during that period of time of exchange and trade, uh, and the impacts that those pandemics were having on our people, and that these concerns were made known to Britain by our tupuna, and that they were largely ignored, that the treaty was a promise in some extent uh, uh, to have a, you know, a greater control on the types of British settlers that were able to come here. However, you know, I would love to have, uh, had, had it gone like how we are treating this pandemic today, that is, you know, with 38 cases or 39 cases, we have a shutdown of all international travel. Um, I'd imagine that this is something that our, our tupuna would have, would have liked to have seen as well that there was greater controls over the immigration policies and over the types of Europeans that were able to come here because of the impact it was having um, on our population. Instead, um, you know, 180 years ago, the, uh, the approach went completely the other way. So from 1840 until 1870, we have the European population goes from 2000 to 250,000 and the approach there or the rationale behind that um, is expressed in the likes of uh, you know aspiring politicians like Newton who um, in the 1870s sort of declared that you know Maori are, Maori are dying out in the wake of a superior race and uh, their extinction will barely be worth discussing um, the, the 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 complete change in attitude there um, is something that we as treaty educators and those that are learning must confront. That is this explicit racism uh, that is completely embedded in our treaty story. And so, if we're trying to apply a rationale but ignore that level of racism and its embeddedness within our systems, um, we're, always, we're always going to have challenges. But I, I couldn't help but think of that um, over this week and in the, in the, in the changes that we've gone through. Um, some of the, as, a, as an educator, we always, it's part of me, there are, there are a bunch of themes and myths that consistently come up in any teaching environment. Um, Okay. And the, the myths are consistent. Um, they are, um, you know, they're sort of universal and that it doesn't matter if we're teaching um, in Auckland or teaching in Christchurch, these myths conti uh, continually present themselves. And I've just chosen three that we might discuss and the impact that Ngāpuhi Speaks has had on being able to address these myths. Um, it's not as though the information, well, key aspects of the information in Ngā Puhi Speaks were never available. The fact, however, that they are in one, one volume and that these come from the testimonies of Kuya and Kaumatua and people from Ngā Puhi is um, invaluable. Uh, that we were able to now send our students to one text if they are to get an understanding and an idea of the relationship that has developed of Māori society, aspects of mana, uh, Māori trade, um, uh, the fact that they can now go to, to one particular text is um, of benefit in terms of um, our treaty education approach. The initial 
um, understanding that students come in with is that, you know, there's this idea that economic development began post-1840 and that it is based entirely on, on, um, on Pākehā initiatives. Ngā Puhi speaks shatters this myth and the, the process of shattering myths is a part of treaty education. It's very difficult to get people to understand the complexities of Māori society when these really um, enduring myths are still in place. The um, expression of Māori enthusiasm with regards to trade and exchange is, I mean, there are just numerous accounts throughout Ngāpuhi Speaks. As early as 1805, um, uh, with Te Pahi's uh, journey to um, Port Jackson to see Governor King, uh, we know that there are interests. These are diplomatic interests, but these are also trade interests. Um, we have various amounts of um, evidence with regards to other rangatira, Patuone and Taonui, for instance, and the seizure of their cargo in Sydney um, in 1830. And uh, the likes of um, Rangatira Humihika and Waikato and their uh, and their journey to England in eighteen in eighteen twenty to shore up that that trade relationship. Um, Papa Manuka Henare's evidence that he presents within the text, and also as a result of his um, enduring research over over long, period, we you know there is a significant amount of evidence that cannot be denied that highlights the centrality and the importance of trade in, within uh, hapu and iwi societies over this period of time. The suppression of this information has more to do with the processes of colonization. Um, it is through the suppression of this information that, um, as Fire Susan was discussing earlier, this idea that, you know, James Busby is the initiator of all you know, sort of developments um, that Te Whakaminenga and um, uh, the things that they are, they are interested in and their um, role within the development of Te Whakaputanga, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, that, um, that these, these roles are diminished as a result of the ability to be able to suppress any of this information around, you know, Māori engagement and, and trade. Um, from what I understand, Patuwuni and Taunui's um, uh, example there is that you know, one of the reasons why that cargo was was released, sorry, I'm uh, sort of skipping ahead, their cargo has been seized in Sydney, um, Port Jackson, and um, by the port authorities. But an argument is put forward to have that cargo released on the basis that, you know, it, the trade from uh, Northland in that fiscal year alone um, equated to approximately thirty-five thousand pounds. So that gives, you know, for students that are involved in our in our courses or participants within our workshops, when they start to hear information like that, it completely shatters this idea of the na of the naive, uh, passive Maori that is sitting there waiting to be colonised, um, which unfortunately. Um, even though the treaty is being taught in schools, um, a lot of our students are still coming through with, with that idea. Um, in terms of uh, Māori, that the Māori text was intended to be a translation of the English text, this is another strong theme that survives in treaty education. Um, a lot of our, we end up getting embroiled in this argument between the two texts. Because of the, uh, the amount of information presented in Ngāpuhi Speaks and the quality of that information that comes through, the historical context leading up to, this, to the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi becomes extremely enriched and lends itself to a Māori understanding of what it is that Te Tiriti He Whakaputanga are about. Um, if we... Um, the only reason why we have these arguments now, I feel, is that um, has been as a consequence of the assertion of sovereignty. Therefore, the English text 
has sort of come into the argument and we've become embroiled around ideas around translation. Um, you know, Henry Williams wasn't really, you know, he didn't have the words. Just, even when we examine this, Henry Williams, Henry Williams is teaching, <laughs> he is teaching Māori, in te reo Māori, about the gospel. Um, the missionaries are the linguists of the day. They are the academics of the day. Um, they, they are teaching about things like the atonement and this idea that utu can be met uh, by the blood of a Hebrew man from 2,000 years ago. And so if we can explain these, if missionaries are able to explain these things, um, it's, it, it's only, it only makes sense, of course, that you know, something like sovereignty can be, uh, can be translated. However, it's not about an issue of translation. What we have are two texts written for two completely different audiences. Um, what do we have of, in terms of evidence from Ngāpū he speaks that lends itself uh, to this interpretation? One is that the missionaries are experts in te reo Māori. Henry Williams has used the word rangatiratanga in he whakaputanga to mean independence. Hobson has then been required to make sure as many of the members of Te Whakaminenga uh, are uh, present on the 6th of February 1840. Mm. So we're expecting that what Hobson, uh, what Henry Williams has done, has taken that term that all of those rangatira have agreed to in 1835 and then completely changed it in 1840. Not only that, but also Ka Wanatanga, which is also in Te Whakaputanga. Why would these, why these narratives survive and uh, is, is really beyond me when there is so much evidence that tells us that actually uh, these, are, these two documents are written for two specific audiences. It's not an issue of translation. The, there are words that are available and, and um, we're, we're all familiar with alternative words that may have been used had the intention been to convey to Rangatira that what was being transferred was um, absolute power and authority. Uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, Fire Margaret Mutu says, you know, the English text is just completely irrelevant. In 1840, it is. No one's discussing it. It isn't there. Uh, <laughs> it is Te Tiriti or Waitangi that is being discussed and, and signed. Um, just lastly there, just conscious of time, um, I just wanted to look at Article 3. There are a number of themes that come through. Article 3 is one where, of course, the provision in Article 3 is uh, the rights and customs of, uh, of the Queen's subjects in England and um, that these are now extended to Māori. Um, we can see that Māori are already engaging in trade significantly. We know that Māori already have um, access to a number of these uh, privileges, uh, or these, these customs rather, and these rights. However, how, um, the interpretation of Article 3 uh, that you know, was put in there to appease this humanitarian movement in Britain, you know, this idea that Britain are going to be far more benevolent colonizers, that the impacts of colonization that have occurred for other native peoples, these are not going to occur here. And Article 3 in the English text is uh, acknowledgement of that, uh, which one of the reasons why Article 3 is seen as, as the most uh, you know, the most radical article in there. It is the only article where Māori receives some, something new. From a Māori perspective, if we go through Ngāpū, he speaks, there are a number of accounts where Māori become aware, rangatira in the north particularly, who by this time Anne Salman describes as metropolitan, that has reached a level of sort of sophistication with regards to engagement in European societies um, and having an understanding of those things that 1,000 Ngāpuhi have travelled to over 69 different nations around the world and have been exposed to aspects of British and colonial culture. That is slavery, um, that is the treatment of Aboriginals in Australia. Um, one account in particular where 
um, Ruatara asks, uh, asks Marsden, you know, why is it that you treat the Aboriginals the way you treat them here? And Marsden's response is, you know, the role of the colonists here is to remove any evidence that would suggest to future generations that Aboriginals are one, organised, and two, resisted. Um, that these issues, to think that our rangatira in the north are not debating these issues as a part of as a part of uh, uh, and even more broader than that um, is, is just beyond me. Um, when we know that they're de debating them the night before the signing of the treaty, uh, we know that they've been raised numerous other times. And therefore, in that light, Article, Article 3 can be seen as a reassurance to those promises guaranteed in Article 2 with regards to rangatiratanga and the exercise of rangatiratanga over our lands, our, our, uh, our peoples, and um, all of our, all of our um, taonga. Um, the, these, um, the, the narratives present throughout Ngāpuhi Speaks, they shed light on um, uh, they shed light on these myths and they, uh, as a consequence, once we're able to extinguish these myths, we're able to get through with the real part of teaching, which is, you know, that conscientization process. And people are able to understand that actually what we're talking about here and what we're discussing is a system of colonization. And as a consequence, um, systems, systems can be altered and changed but it is premised on an understanding of, uh, of the actual truth, um, particularly from a, Ma from a Māori perspective, which is, you know, so, so um, wonderfully um, collated uh, um, in, in this text, Ngāpuhi speaks. So finally, uh, just in closing, I just wanted to share one last example. Um, I was able to go to Rangihaua, on the banks of the Parramatta River. This made the news a bit last at the end of last year. Um, uh, for those of you who might remember, uh, um, a woman there was claiming rights to Rangihaua that her tupuna had, um, um, had made arrangements with uh, Aboriginal rangatira there. The thing is, is that there, there was some truth in that story. Unfortunately, due to the media's presentation of the story, um, none of the history was brought out about Rangihaua Reserve. Um, Rangihaua, of course, is named after um, the, uh, the territory of Ruatara's a bit north of Waitangi there, uh, which is also called Rangihaua. Uh, but in 1811, the first school or institution for teaching uh, young rangatira in British farm and European farming practices, but also in, in literacy, that is reading and writing in Te Reo Māori, was established on the banks of the Parramatta, pa Parramatta River in Sydney. Um, and this, um, once, once students in our uh, classes or within our workshops hear this, it completely astounds them that Rangatira being sent to Sydney as early as 1811, um, Marsden's daughter, Jane Marsden, makes the comment in 1811 that the site of a Māori in, in Parramatta is so common that it barely warrants a second glance. Now, um, as a result of all of this history, this rich and beautiful history from the North, we're able to expose a lot of these myths and as a consequence, go through with the real part of, of teaching, uh, which, is, which is that conscientization process. Hey, these are myths. Uh, here is the evidence to support that. Uh, these are some of the things that we have not been taught, but that you have now been exposed to, and as a consequence, can now um, can now move forward in your education. Um, so, from from my uh, from my perspective as a Te Atukura educator, I um, uh, I can't really overstate uh, the value of of Ngāpu He Speaks as an educational tool. Um, and I, prop, I look forward to the day when other evolves and that we have a rich, rich source uh, from every iwi uh, with regards to, you know, those processes and that development 
period leading up to the signing of the treaty. Um, so that being said, uh, kia ora rā e te whānau, uh, kā nui te mihi. What would a decolonised curriculum look like in education? Yeah, I mean, that's been a huge, huge topic over the last 20, well, you know, probably longer in Te Ao Māori, but um, the nation's been having that conversation over the last year, two years. We, I would imagine that hapu would have a, a very direct influence on the types of information that are being taught arohe. I would imagine that... Um, you know, mainstream schools, when it comes to learning history, would learn about, first and foremost, the history of the lands that they're on um, before uh, before anything else. I, I also think that, uh, the, you know, a, a curriculum that exposes and allows our students to discuss in a safe environment aspects of white supremacy, colonialism and that these things can be discussed openly and drawn out um yeah that this would that these these types of foci would be a part of um a curriculum that honors te tiriti or waitangi um all of the stuff that's spoken of in Ngāpuhi speaks all of that history all of that kōrero from those kaumātua um those kuia <laughs> that if you don't have access to those kuya and komatua, then where do you where do you get that knowledge from? Um, fortunately for the people in Tenota, you have Ngāpuhi Speaks, and for those that have made it part of our curriculum in, in universities, uh, that's fine. But for the majority of, of New Zealand, particularly in, in high school, um, they're still really relying on outdated... Um, <laughs> And in, in many cases, completely debunked evidences. That <laughs> um, so, yeah, there there needs to be a bit more. Uh, there needs to be a a lot a, a lot of maturing in that space around our discussions of colonialism, the impacts of colonization, um, before we can um, uh, sort of start to comprehend what you know what a curriculum might 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 look like, um, but. But personally, I, I definitely feel that that, that must be an Aroha-based uh, curricula when it comes to teaching about, about mm. history. The, the distinctions between what's happened in Ngāpuhi and what's happened in my area, in Ngāti Kahungunuki Wairarapa, and then what's happened down in Ngaitahu, these, these are all different. And their treaty stories will be somewhat different. And, um, yeah, uh, does, that re does that answer the question? Good point. Well done, Maria. Thank you. Well, well done. done, Molly. She did well. Hold on. What a time that is today.